I, wa I want to call to order Thursday, January 30, 2020, monthly school board meeting. Uh, board members, you have seen and you have reviewed the agenda as presented. My entertain a motion to accept the agenda. So moved. It's been moved by Mrs. Ogburn. Is there a second? Seconded. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. All those in favor say aye. 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 The ayes have it. The motion carries. We now will turn our meeting over to our superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, uh, members of the board, and to our guests this evening. We're going to begin our meeting as we always do, which will be with the Pledge of Allegiance. That'll be followed by a moment of silence. And I will say that we're joined by students from Longan Elementary School who are going to lead us in the pledge, and they are joined by Lisa Woods, their resource teacher, who's going to come and introduce them um, as we get in place to have the Pledge of Allegiance. Come on up. Good evening, I am proud to present our SCA officers for 2019-2020. We have Kira Harris, Giselle Firestone, we have Jackson Hargett, Alyssa Hargett, and Luke Anderson. Please pause for a moment of silence or um, personal reflection, and then we'll get a chance to meet those with us. All right, that concludes our moment of silence. You may be seated, and for those who have joined us for the pledge, if you'd come around um, so we could get a chance to meet you. And then we'll be joining uh, the members of the audience for our performance highlight next. All right, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell, colleagues, parents, and guests. My name is Christopher Mosley. I am the Education Specialist for Performing Arts. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome, um, for our performance highlight this evening, the Henrico High School Center for the Arts Music Theater Level 2 class under the direction of Mr. Billy Dye. Mr. Dye has taught at Henrico High School for 10 years. During his career, he has taught music at the secondary level teaching chorus, music appreciation, and AP music theory. He has served as vocal supervisor at Bush Gardens, music coordinator for the National Red Cross Convention, which included conducting a 1,000 voice chorus and orchestra, and as the music advisor for Governor Gilmore's inaugural prayer breakfast. His varied background and experiences in the arts are said to make an unquestionable contribution to the growth and development of young, well-rounded performers and musicians. Tonight, we have in attendance their proud principal, uh, Mrs. Castillo Rose, and the director of the Center for the Arts, Dr. Stephanie Poxen. Could you all please stand and re be recognized at this time? <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, this week, um, we lost one of our staff members at Henrico High School, and the uh, group tonight would like to 
let me be specific, our band director passed away uh, on Monday. So the students wanted to dedicate their performance tonight uh, in his memory. So please help me welcome to the stage the Henrico High School CFA MT2 Choir. Thank you. Cashwell and our guests. My name is Andy Jenks, and at this point, we would like to recognize the Helping Hand Volunteer Award winner for the month of January, an award presented to Henrico Schools volunteers who make extraordinary contributions to our schools. We have dual recipients this month, Julia and Todd Levy of Verina Elementary School. Julia and Todd, please come forward. I'll tell you a little bit about Julia and Todd, who were nominated 
by Brooke Thompson, the former associate principal there, and David Williams, a STEAM teacher at Verina, and Kim Slayton as well, the librarian, nominated you both. Now, Julia and Todd Levy are the kind of dedicated volunteers who make a good school great. The parents of a Verina fifth grader, the two can be found regularly at the school, giving their time and effort to make things better for students, staff members, and the community. They do things like help with field day and support the STEAM lab. They're active PTA members and are at Verina volunteering at least once a week. According to Brooke Thompson, Julia is a tremendous advocate for Verina and the school's biggest fan. She's always the first to offer her time and energy to any event we wanted to implement. Her kind words and generous spirit are an inspiration. When we were lucky enough to receive hundreds of books for students, she volunteered her time to help stamp and organize them. She's even enlisted her mother for volunteer opportunities. David and Kim said in November, Verina students and staff completed a community outreach project that would not have been possible without the levy support. Students, staff, and parent volunteers, along with the HCPS facility staff, constructed and decorated 14 dog houses for dogs in Verina that live outside and don't have adequate housing. The levies used their partnerships with local businesses to get all the materials and tools donated. They helped us read and understand the building plans and were prominent in the actual construction, which means Julia and Todd Levy are builders in more ways than one. Thank you and congratulations. Mr. Chairman, members of the school board, Dr. Cashwell, colleagues and guests. Tonight we recognize our fall Virginia High School League state champions. At this time, I would like to invite Principal Brian Fellows, Director of Student Activities Michael Kidd, Coach Kara Ayers, and members of the Deep Run Competition Cheer Team to come forward. The competition cheer team finished in first place in three or four invitationals this season. They won the Region 5B title for the third year in a row and won their first state championship. The team had numerous first team All-State performers. Lily Bingle was the VHSL State Cheerleader of the Year and Coach Ayers was the Virginia High School League Coach of the Year. Congratulations on a tremendous season. Next, we invite Coach Drew Spicer and members of the Deep Run Girls cross-country team, Eva Brooks, 
Mia Callisto, Kenzie Dillman, Claire Novak, Paula Prada, Jenny Sanborn, Riley Shindell, Julia Snow, Mackenzie Steele, and Katrin Towie and Sydney Walters to come forward. The girls cross country team finished as a region 5B runner up, but rebounded to win the VHSL 5A state championship. Numerous runners were awarded first team all region and first team all state honors. Congratulations on your special season. We would like to invite coaches Kevin Pond, Travis Williams, Tony Steiner, Christian Taylor, and members of the Deep Run Boys volleyball team, Cade Terrell, Sean McDermott, Marco Stepnatovich, Grant Baker, and Tyler Weber to come forward. I think we're all seeing a theme here for the fall. Deep Run did pretty well. Um, Deep Run Boys Volleyball finished the season with a perfect 23-0 record. They won the Region 5B title and also their third consecutive state championship. This is the program's fourth state championship overall. Numerous players were given all region and all state honors. Cade Terrell was the region, metro, and state player of the year. And Coach Kevin Pond was the region and state coach of the year. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we invite Coach Josh Aldridge and members of the Deep Run Golf Team, Charlie Hansen, Zach Smith, Brent Harbison, Trent Sevum, Ian Walters, and Corey Hummer to come forward. The Deep Run Golf Team won another region title and their fifth consecutive VHSL state championship. They have won state titles in six of the last seven years. Last June, the team won the national championship at the NHSGA National Golf Tournament. Numerous players were named to the all region and all state teams and finished in, with national rankings. Congratulations on these accomplishments. Good evening, everyone. Hello, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Cashwell, school board members, all Henrico stakeholders. Today, we're very excited to recognize the many achievements of Henrico teacher leaders this year 
related to national board certification. My name is Drew Baker. I'm from the Department of Professional Learning and Leadership on behalf of our whole department. We would like to celebrate, first off, the 26 Henrico County public school teachers who achieved national board certification this year from the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards in 2019, and then the three additional Henrico teachers who renewed their certification. For those of you who may not know, becoming national board certified is a rigorous process, and it's the profession's highest mark of accomplishment in terms of classroom teaching and professional learning. This year represents an uptick in HCPS teachers earning certification from this group. 11 Henrico teachers earned designations in both 2018 and 2017, and now we have 26. To become certified by the National Board, teachers must submit detailed portfolios to be reviewed by their peers. They include videos of candidates teaching, documented professional accomplishments, reflective essays and examples of students' work, plus they have to pass an exam relevant to his or her subject level and instruction. Becoming board certified is really important because it's been linked to increased teacher retention, teacher empowerment, and professional engagement. The board certified process has been shown to significantly increase teacher reflective practice and the impact that they have on students. So please join us in celebrating and congratulating our new MBCTs. We'll call them up one by one so you guys can stand on up now. Uh, so first off, we have Megan Atkins from Springfield Park Elementary School. <laughs> Whitney Beaton from Douglas Freeman High School. Kelly Becker from Glenlee Elementary School. Jenny Brady from Shady Grove Elementary School. Jessica Capano from Maud Trevette Elementary School. Amber Fugate from Mayford Elementary School. Kathleen, Kathleen Gooden from Twin Hickory Elementary School. Congrats, man. Andrew Hall from Glen Allen High School. <laughs> Stacy Hilton from Springfield Park Elementary School. <laughs> Jennifer DeGraw Hughes from River's Edge Elementary School. <laughs> Melissa Jeffrey from Sandston Elementary School. <laughs> Donna Letson from Twin Hickory Elementary School. Lindsay Panley from Glen Allen High School. Amy Stills from the Academy at Virginia Randolph. Ellen Terry from Henrico High School. <laughs> and Laura Van Bielent from Hungry Creek Middle School. We also have with us today Jackie Batkins from Seven Pines Elementary School who recertified. Congratulations to our new and renewed National Board teachers who could be here today. We had some others who have um, school conferences right now, but uh, they are also recognized in our press release. Next, we would like to highlight an award uh, presented to this division as a whole by the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards. The National Board included Henrico County Public Schools among 11 divisions in the, uh, in the country, awarding us the designation of National Board Accomplished District. Among Central Virginia school divisions, Henrico employs the most teachers certified by the professional organization. We now have 153, that's about 4% of our teachers. A statement from the National Board said that Henrico County Public Schools had seen tremendous growth in the number of teachers pursuing and achieving national board certification and led the state in 2019. So we're state champs. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Peggy Brookings, the organization's president and CEO, said that Henrico and the other school divisions chosen for this have taken extraordinary set steps to improve student learning and teacher retention through this award. So over the past two years, we um, have transitioned our national board coaching cohort, where now we have Henrico teachers teaching other Henrico teachers. And this is one of the reasons why we've been able to expand the program so much. So to uh, be recognized in front of school board today, we would actually like to bring forward uh, three of our five national board facilitators who did so much of the coaching for this group. And it's one of the reasons why we've expanded our capacity. So we wanna thank uh, our three that are here and our two that are not. Our two that are not are Ms. Wiley Honeycutt from Freeman High School and Lee Naughton from Henrico. Rico High School, but we have with us Megan Bouton from Echo Lake Elementary, 
Anne-Marie Slinkman from Tucker High School. And Shannon Wakefield from Greenwood Elementary School and Tuckahoe Elementary School. Thank you all so much for the support and congratulations facilitators and MBCTs for all your hard work. As folks make their way back, we'll prepare for our next item, which is the Henrico highlight. Um, and I would just add that it's certainly a pleasure to have gotten to hear from musical talent like we had tonight from Henrico to celebrate so many student athletes and our teacher accomplishments. We definitely have an awful lot to be proud of. <coughs> All right, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, each month at this time, we show you highlights from around the county, examples of our schools preparing students to be <coughs> life ready. Uh, but typically, we don't hear from our students about what life ready means to them until tonight, that is. So if you direct your attention to the screens, I am pleased to present the student voices of Henrico County Public Schools from the classes of 2020, 2021, and even 2031 and 2032. But I think that would be a good idea for like a solution. Made it this far and now I'm about to go on to my college years. I actually want to be a teacher. I really want to be a criminal lawyer when I grow up do more than just hand a paper and I like to get active. Something way different than what we're used to doing in school. Kids are hashtag life ready. If you know what you want to do in life or what you want to do, then go for it. I honestly like unstructured classes better. We talk about like world events and it's more like a discussion and I feel like I've learned a lot more through those than like a teacher standing at the front of the class and lecturing. Well, I like both. Structure is helpful, but also open-ended type of things give more room for creativity. I mean, there's sometimes I work way harder than I'm supposed to because I get very into a topic and then I write like pages on it. Like I did a 32-page book report for Miss Mills last year just because I was like into the book. I'm very lucky to grow up in a county that has like a lot of academic opportunities, like so many options of coming to um, your different centers and then you have governor school too and then you have IB so it's like really what you want to do and where you want to be. I want to be a therapist or like a psychologist so I'm taking psychology right now. Not everybody's going to be want, want to be a scientist or an, a writer or like an English teacher or a historian so these extracurricular classes are really helping open up especially if you don't know what you want to do you get to dibble dabble in other things. I went from wanting to do veterinary science to wanting to be a speech pathologist. I would like to get a business for at the time business major in college. I want to be an athletic trainer. I mean I'll be a certified EMT by June and just knowing that I have this education in high school for free and how it's available to me for what I've learned. I'm leaning toward a prosecutor, some, like something lawyer-ish. Um, maybe a politician, I don't know, but the good thing about criminal justice is the intersection. I, you know, I have the tools and when I do go to college and you know, further develop them, I can take whichever path I decide. My teachers do a good job of trying to prepare us the best they can for the real world and helping us like choose the best career path, I guess, to what best suit us. One of my favorite things about this county is the teachers and I just think there's so much care that they have for their kids. I've never had a single teacher who wasn't willing to stay after me and talk about something that I wasn't feeling good about, especially when it came to projects and stuff. It's good to say that they establish connections with the students because the best thing is for them to be comfortable and to get real life connections for when they get out of school. Because I feel like the best thing is experience, getting to know about the world, not just in the books. Know what really you're applying yourself to outside of the school. Later on in life when you graduate, you're gonna have to do stuff on your own and be responsible for it. So, it just helps you get ready for that. I want to be a doctor. I can like put a doctor suit on and a doctor hat and then I can give people shots. Um, my first thought was a sweatshirt worker. I want to be a librarian, find myself a job, 
into the house. Um, I want to be a um work for the FBI. You tell people what to do in the government. I want to be a YouTuber. I'd like to become a star soccer player when I grow up. Be a rock star or be a teacher or be a doctor. Like me and that I want to be a what's called that? That gallops on a horsey and then, and then the horsey gets to eat a lot of yummy food, like grapes or something. On our agenda is for us to uh, have our mission statement, and we're going to ask that Ms. Kinsella would read it for us. Henrico County Public Schools, an innovative leader in educational excellence, will actively engage our students in diverse educational, social, and civic learning experiences that inspire and empower them to become contributing citizens. Thank you so much, Ms. Kinsella. The next item on the agenda is the public forum. This is the time where citizens are invited to address the school board on any matter of concern about the school division. We ask that each speaker will come to the microphone and what I will do is I will call off three names at a time and hopefully you'll uh, line up one behind the other. And when you, when you do come to the microphone, all we ask is that you'll clearly state your name and neighborhood or school affiliation. To assist you in tracking your time, there's a timekeeping system on the podium. The light will be green. As you begin your remarks, the yellow light means you have one minute remaining, and we ask that you stop speaking when the light turns red. The school board is here tonight to hear from you, the community. Speakers should speak directly to the board. We will not be responding to the speakers, but we do sincerely appreciate your attendance here tonight and providing your input. At the last check, we had 46 persons to sign up in advance to speak. Do the math and that's 184 minutes or about three hours. Here's what we're gonna do this evening. The school board and staff are prepared to hear from you tonight. However, the board will limit your remarks to three minutes instead of four. So people aren't waiting for up to three hours to speak. Is there a motion from my colleagues to amend the time limit for each speaker from four to three minutes? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Say, any opposed? Aye. The motion is passed. If we're unable to get through the first 46 people in a timely manner, we may not be able to hear from others who did not sign up in advance. Please know for us, a united front can be as powerful as many individual speakers. Neighborhoods may wish to select a spokesperson during the spokesperson's remarks. The persons can ask his or her supporters to stand and be recognized. Again, remarks will be limited to three minutes instead of four, so people aren't waiting for up to three hours to speak. Let's begin with those who signed in advance. The first three names I'm gonna call, if you could please come um, in this order, and please forgive me in advance if I mispronounce your name, you can correct me at the microphone. It's not intentional, it's just my inability to say it properly. First is Ms. Yao Le Levin, Second is Ms. Tanisha Lewis, and the third is Zanab Bowens. They can sit on the front row. And what you can do is you can sit on the front two seats and come one after the other. Good evening and welcome to the new board members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you tonight. My name is Yael Levine and I live in Greenwood Glen. We are currently zoned for Greenwood Elementary School, Hungary Creek Middle School, and Glen Allen High School. All proposals by Cropper have us, together with Magnolia Ridge and River Mill, moving to Brooklyn Middle School and Hermitage High School. Some have said that we shouldn't be going to these Brooklyn District Schools. Yet Hermitage High School is also a Brooklyn District School. Moreover, there is great overlap between magisterial districts and school attendance zones due to the limited number of schools. Some have said we would wreck Glen Allen High School. I am confused and offended by this sentiment as we are all part of one Henrico. Ashley Lewis, who will be here soon, has presented what we call option Z to Reverend Cooper, and all of you should have seen it by now. Option Z impacts significantly fewer students than any of Cropper's options. Option Z also better adheres to the geographical guidelines, natural boundaries, maintaining and maintaining cohesive communities. 
Option Z is better for all of Henrico. Option Z only impacts 471 middle school students, whereas Cropper's options impact as follows. D1, 1,751 students. D2, 1,476 students. E1, 1,529 students. E2, 1,595 students. Option Z impacts only 385 high school students, whereas Cropper's options impact as follows. D1, 1,109 students. D2, 928 students. E1, 1,250 students. E2, 1,170 students. More specifically, with any of Cropper's current options, we still have some schools at over 98% capacity, capacity, and some even over 100% capacity. Whereas option Z, no middle school is over 93% capacity and no high school is over 95% capacity. We are formally asking you that you ask Cropper and the committees to put out a model based on option Z, as it is in the best interest of the entire county to have a redistricting that impacts the fewest numbers of students and, better, and that better adheres to this redistricting guidelines. I'm just gonna give the... Um, And thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Lewis. Good evening. I'm going to do my best. I spent six hours getting this to four minutes, so bear with me. Good evening. My name is Tanisha Lewis. I have a fourth grader in the Henrico School System and live in Fairfield along Greenwood Road between the Greenwood Glen subdivision and Francis Road. These are my colleagues here. I also happen to be a social scientist with over 13 years of experience working to understand the influence that social determinants like our education and where we live have on who we become and how long we live. This perspective is why I believe it's important for me to stand before you today. I applaud our school system for wanting to go about redistricting with the lens of achieving equity. I'm concerned though because, as Dr. MLK Jr. said, sometimes a law is just on its face and unjust in its application. The same idea works here too. Sometimes this new school policy seems just, but is, un in, is unjust in how it's being applied. For example, one argument during this redistricting process is that the kids who live around me should attend Brooklyn Middle. It's been said that shifting our neighborhood's kids from Hungry Creek to Brooklyn would improve school performance. It is misguided and inherently classist and racist to suggest simply adding different folks to the mix will improve things. It's also unfair to suggest any students move to and from vastly different school infrastructures without a plan for ensuring their academic success. Further, research put out from VCU this year shows wealthier Henrico parents who don't want their children to attend rezoned schools will get around it some way. Back in April, my husband and I were excited to move to our first home in my son's current school zone, Greenwood, Hungry Creek, Glen Allen. Being a young family for two years, we saved and searched to find something just right and chose our particular school feeder pattern. Imagine how deflated we felt just a month or two later when we discovered that our efforts may have been, might have been in vain. So two questions really quickly. Here, Michael parents shouldn't have a problem sending our kids to any school in the area, but honestly, many of us here do. Why is that? A school like Hunger Creek is at capacity and performing well. Nearby Brooklyn Middle is under capacity and struggling. Why is that? The answer to both questions is the same. It's not who attends these schools, but it's the school's infrastructure that makes a difference. What matters is if the resources and opportunities exist for our kids to advance in education and in life. I know what it's like to have to maintain a 4.4 GPA and 17 extracurricular roles just to be looked at by a top 10 university because my school is like the proper infrastructure. I won't allow my child to have to deal with the same and no child in Henrico should. It seems this process is being approached in the wrong way. Moving swiftly and correctly to get this done in one thing is one thing, hurrying along and being wrong is another. There's nothing wrong with taking the time to say, hey, let's pause a bit to make sure we have all the input we need at this point before moving ahead. As someone experienced in systems change and reshaping entities, healthy give and take is part of the process, but confusion and discord is not. Students succeed when adults are doing our part. If resident feedback is missing from certain areas, then the collection methods need to be re readjusted. With regard to where I live, feedback from my neighborhood area needs to be incorporated into this process. And parents need real solutions for redistricting concerns, whether by delayed implementation, variance, or both, until there are plans in place for making infrastructures equitable. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Zainab Yusafi Bowens. I'm a single mother of a rising kindergartner. I migrated to America from the Middle East in 1982. Shortly thereafter, my young mother abandoned our family and left my blue collar father to raise two very young children in a brand new country where we knew no one and did not know the language. 
We grew up very poor in Virginia Beach. However, we were lucky in that we happened to be one of the lower class neighborhoods districted for highly rated public schools that consisted of predominantly high achieving students. Because of this opportunity at a great education, I made it into college and have since made a career and life for myself. I spent most of my adult life living in the city of Richmond. I struggled to get where I am today and am fortunate to have been able to recently purchase a townhome in River Mill in Glen Allen. The main reason I purchased in River Mill was to afford my daughter the opportunity to attend the schools we are currently zoned for, Greenwood, Hungry Creek, and Glen Allen. Today I'm speaking for River Mill, Greenwood Glen, and Magnolia Ridge. All of the redistricting options ha have us moving to Brooklyn Middle and Hermitage High. I ask that you delay this redistricti redistricting at least for the Fairfield, Glen Allen area for the following reasons. The new River Mill Elementary School will be ready in the fall of 2022. We should wait until we see how that will impact feeder patterns. The Hungary Creek Middle School expansion of 200 new seats will be ready in the fall of 2022 as well. That should suffice to accommodate keeping our neighborhoods at Hungary Creek Middle School. Our three neighborhoods together will have a total of only 206 middle school students, most of whom are already attending Hungary Creek um, and Glen Allen High School, oh, sorry, uh, and already accounted for capacity-wise. In addition, enrollment trends for Hungary Creek Middle School and Glen Allen High School are decreasing. The proposals have us moving to Brooklyn Middle School and Hermitage High School, but more than 500 units by Telegraph Road called Retreat at One are being built and zoned for Brooklyn and Hermitage. That alone could put Brooklyn over capacity when it is an already struggling school and will greatly increase capacity at Hermitage, which is also struggling academically. Keeping our three neighborhoods at our current schools will help alleviate increased enrollment trends for Brooklyn and Hermitage. We at River Mill, Greenwood, Glen, and Magnolia Ridge are the diversity at our schools. Both options or all the options fail to fulfill the county's goal of creating an equitable balance between all the schools in the county. Instead, all options make the schools less economically diverse. Thank you. Next, we'll have Rachel Loving, Heather Walker, and Liam Sheldon. Good evening. My name is Rachel Loving and I'm a resident of the church run subdivision that runs between Three Chopped Road and Church Road. I have a third grader and a kindergartner at Short Pump Elementary School. Church run is currently zoned for Short Pump Elementary, Pocahontas Middle and Godwin High, all of which are in close proximity to our neighborhood. In fact, we are walking distance to Pocahontas, which serves as our voting precinct. Church run has been redistricted every time this process has occurred. Our neighbor on my street, and her, one of our neighbors on my street had her son's school changed at every single level, and he attended six schools over his 13-year education. As of yesterday, option 2D is the only option that maintains our current feeder pattern, and our neighborhood would like to strongly advocate for this or any other option that keeps us at our current schools as exhibited by the signed petition represented by nearly every church-run homeowner, which I've just turned over to the deputy clerk there. We feel that the other, that the other um, proposed options will will, that will change our middle and high schools to Cuyoxin and Tucker would divide our larger community and will quadruple the travel distance for our children. And all options, with the exception of 2D, a boundary is being drawn between Church Run and Windsor Place, which share a shared community center and walking path. As you can see from your maps on, on your website and the detailed map we have attached to our petition, this line does not follow a natural boundary and contradicts all of the redistricting criteria outlined by Henrico County Public Schools. As you may know, Henrico County is currently in the settlement phase of a three chopped road expansion project, which will include sidewalks running on either side of church, a three chopped road, leading from the entrance of our neighborhood straight to Pocahontas Middle School. The county already purchased a deed of easement from our family in August of 2018, which is, illust is illustrated in the blueprint that I provided and attached there. My fear is that my children will lose the opportunity to attend Pocahontas, which is right next door to them, not because it was necessary to move, but because the secondary committee was given too little information when they started the process and is now too overwhelmed by information to remember many of the important conversations that took place during the gallery walk. They need help from leaders that know us best to synthesize this information. 
Even with the release of the new middle school map, we urge board members to remind the committees which communities have requested a second look. We elected you all as school board officials so that you can represent our voices in matters like these. After observing the secondary committee in action, I feel that um, they would welcome the board members' guidance as they make their final tweaks to these maps. We respectfully ask that the committee and the, and the board place our small corner of Three Chopped and Church Road back with Windsor Place with all other options for all the reasons outlined in our document. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Cashwell, and members of the school board. My name is Heather Walker. I live in the Greenwood Glen subdivision, and I have two sweet boys at Greenwood Elementary, one in kindergarten and one in fourth grade. I was hoping to start this evening on a really high note of congratulations and gratitude for service. I wanted to talk about how hopeful I am with the new ideas and energy mixed in with this group, and that it may become the best thing ever for Henrico's children, and I do feel that way, but with the maps that came out yesterday, I have to focus elsewhere right now. I am so frustrated. I have missed two big events at my son's school and another one as I stand here because I need you to hear how exasperated I am with this. Because we are not permitted to talk directly with committee members or Mr. Cropper on a regular basis, it is up to you to hear us and change the dialogue. I am beginning to feel after observing four months of committee meetings that the members don't actually have a voice in anything other than minor changes based on small roads or neighborhood idiosyncrasies. They work so hard and spend so many hours on the maps only to have Mr. Cropper basically tell them, thanks for the work you're doing, but stay in your lane. He absolutely dismisses them. The goal is transparency, but it feels more like a buzzword than reality. If research and data-based feedback is being ignored, why make the process transparent at all? It is beginning to feel like the goal is to inundate us with as many maps as possible so that people are confused or disheartened and give up advocating for their communities. I know that's not what you want, but it is exactly how I feel right now, and I bet I'm not alone. People who have been shoulder to shoulder with me through this process are feeling like their voices don't matter, mine included. Many of us are discussing leaving the county because we are starting to feel duped. I have been teaching in public schools for 20 years. It is my specialty in this life and I am so very proud to do it. Our children create communities in their schools, not just their neighborhoods. The principals of Greenwood Elementary and Hungry Creek work very hard to create a K-8 continuum concept that directly supports the educational and emotional development of kids. There is no transition more difficult in the public school K-12 continuum, well, any school K-12 continuum, than the fifth to sixth grade transition. The schools are beautifully diverse, racially, socioeconomically, <clears throat> and religiously. I ask again that you push Mr. Cropper to keep the feeder pattern of Greenwood Elementary, Hungry Creek, and Glen Allen together and allow it to be an example for what greatness can happen with communication among levels. I don't know what else I can say. I am tired of missing events with my family at my boys' school and not being heard. I want to have faith that you all, a new team of focused board members working together with those with such experience, will hear me this time. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity for me to speak tonight. My name is Liam Sheldon and I'm a seventh grader at Hungry Creek Middle School. I live in Glen, Greenwood Glen. I am worried about the redistricting. I was looking forward to going to Glen Allen High School with all my friends. It is very hard to think that I'll be going to Hermitage High School instead and probably will know a handful of people at such a really big school. The transition to high school is difficult as is. I am very anxious about transitioning without my friends. Please keep Grima Glen and Hunger Creek at Glen Allen High School. I would also like to add that although technically Hunger Creek is overcrowded, when you go there, it is not actually crowded or anything. You can ask students or teachers at my school and they'll probably give you the same answer. My guess is what I said about Hunger Creek is also true about Glen Allen. Thank you. Next we'll have Aiden Shelton, Sarah Cheek Taylor, and Savannah Taylor. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hold on. Before you start, hold on. Give me one second. Next, can we have Nathaniel Hurt and Ashley Lewis? Next, please. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. My name is Aiden Sheldon. I'm a fifth grader at Greenwood Elementary. I live in Greenwood Glen. I would like to ask you to please change the rules to allow students to finish in the same schools where they started. It's, a really bad, it's really bad for us to have to switch schools. If I'm redistricted, I will start middle school at Hungry Creek and would have to switch to Brooklyn Middle School for seventh and eighth grade. The majority of my friends from sixth grade will, will stay at Hungry Creek. In option D1, only 12% of my grade will switch with me. That's 58 students to spread among a large class of seventh graders. I might not even have one single friend in, the cl in a class with me. Middle school is already scary. I don't want to have to start it twice. Thank you and have a good evening. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell. Um, I'm here tonight, my name's Nathaniel. I go to Highland Springs High School. I'm zoned to Glen Allen High School, and I take an hour bus ride all the way down to Highland Springs every morning and every evening to get back to my home. Um, so this is not what I originally signed up for to speak. I was actually gonna speak on something else, but recently um, I had a problem at school. Um, one of my teachers discriminated against me because of an article of clothing that I was wearing that had a political statement on it. Um, I addressed this issue with my principal. I had a meeting with my principal and my counselor. I had a meeting with my principal and this teacher and a couple other administrators. But I did not feel the problem was resolved. This teacher never apologized or accepted responsibility for what he did. And I'm here to kind of present a solution to um, not this problem, but the overarching problem. Um, is that do teachers know about the full rights that students have at school? Do they know that we have First Amendment rights? Do they know the full complexity of that? So I'm here tonight to propose that we institute a professional development program and, or class that teaches teachers about the First Amendment rights of students and how to deal with situations um, that deal with the First Amendment rights of students. Um, I will be sending a proposal over to all of your emails um, at the conclusion of this uh, meeting. And um, it would also talk about how um, we, I would like H Henrico County Public Schools to release a statement about how discrimination will not be tolerated at Henrico County Schools. Um, thank you for your time and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Good evening. My name is Ashley Lewis and I live in River Mill. I've spoken before some of you previously, but I wanted to introduce myself to the new board members and welcome you. I was a student at Luther Memorial before attending Hanover County Public Schools. I'm sure you're aware of the redistricting that is currently underway, and a majority of your constituents are not pleased with the proposed options. These options move far too many students around, and there is a better way to accomplish all of the said goals in this redistricting. Reverend Cooper represents my neighborhood as well as Magnolia Ridge and Greenwood Glen. I have presented him with a better option for the entire county. Why do I care about the whole county? Because we are one Henrico. This is not about which magisterial districts should attend which school. There has been talk about keeping Fairfield District students out of Hungry Creek Middle and out of Glen Allen High School due to them being in the Brooklyn District. However, our neighborhoods are being moved back Move, being moved to Hermitage High School, which is also in the um, Fairfield District. Um, I'm sorry, Brooklyn District. I would like to point out that there, there's a great overlap between magisterial districts and school attendance zones all across the county, but especially between Brooklyn, Fairfield, Three Chopped, and Tuckahoe districts. I have provided the board with the following documentation. Brooklyn Middle School is in the Fairfield District, yet 55.4% of its students come from Brooklyn District. Adams Elementary School is in the Fairfield District, yet 63.5% of its students come from the Verina District. Springfield Park Elementary School is in the Three Chop District, yet 55.7% of its students come from the Brooklyn District. 
Holman Middle School is in the three CHOP district, yet 39.2 of its students come from the Brooklyn district. Tucker High School is in the three CHOP district, yet 47.1% of its students come from the Brooklyn district. Pocahontas Middle is in the three CHOP district, yet 43.6% of its students come from the Tuckahoe district. Tuckahoe Middle is in the three CHOP district, yet 71.3% of its students come from the Tuckahoe district. And the list goes on. Um, that is the reality of our county. Because of the limited number of schools that we have, we all have to share schools, which is fine. We are one Henrico. And the talk of those people not being allowed in our schools is beyond offensive. I implore each one of you to advocate for Cropper to model option Z as it best keeps Henrico County one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we're going to have Tariana Lewis, Lou Ross, and Mac Ross. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so I'll have Lou Ross next, Anna Lee Bockstrom, and then Sean Cholanuk. Uh, hello, my name is Lou Ross, and I'm from Church Run. And uh, my son asked for half of my time, but in the interest of moving things along, I'm going to go ahead and yield to him. And uh, maybe he'll leave me a minute at the end. Hi, my name is Hunter Ross, and I'm in eighth grade at Pocahontas Middle School. I thought I would share to you why I think I should stay at Godwin and not be redistricted. My entire middle school is going to, to Godwin. Two weeks ago, we all went over there to hear them talk about schedules and what to expect in high school. We never got invited to Tucker or Freeman, just Godwin. Godwin is close to my house, and I've done many summer camps and events in the cafeteria. We drive past Godwin at least five to six times per week. I could not tell you where Tucker is or where Freeman is. I'm sure I will be nervous on my first day of high school, but at least I will know the school and will have a lot of students from Pocahontas there with me. Also, I know a lot of older kids from playing Little League and other sports in the community. Godwin is more than just my neighborhood school. I've played baseball at Tucko the Little League since T-ball. All of the kids at TLL go to Godwin, Freeman, or Deep Run. None of them go to Tucker. All my friends and I have played uh, with each other for years. We have talked about going to high school and playing baseball together. Being switched to Tucker, I would be sent to a school where I don't know anybody. I'm sure it is a nice school, but I haven't spent the last eight years growing up with Tucker students talking about our high school years together. That is why I think we should stay at Godwin. My, ho my house is right next door and right, my house is right around the corner and I also have three little sisters coming up behind me. We can walk to Pocahontas. They all do softball and gymnastics with other kids in the area who all will remain at school close to their house. If we get moved and I have to go to a different school much farther away than the ones that I should go to, they are going to have the same problem happen to them that might happen to me. And I don't think that is right. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I originally was going to speak tonight um, on the leadership process. A uh, specific example, uh, I was going to talk about one of our school board leaders referencing a line on, our, on the maps, which is breaking up our community as being nuts, her words, not mine. Uh, yet as the maps continue to, be, to, to come out, that line continues to be drawn that way, uh, sending my neighborhood four times further away for middle and high. Um, so we're saying that the residents of Ohio and the committee members, many of whom live on the other side of the county, know better than the person that lives in and is elected to represent that area. That's what I think is nuts. Thank you. Hi, my name is Annalie Barkstrom, and I'm here with the Crestview Area Coalition uh, to speak tonight in support of keeping Crestview zoned to Crestview, Tuckahoe Middle School, and Freeman High School. Um, most recently, option E, but as so many maps have come out, I just wanted to state the name of the schools. Thank you for your time and everyone here. Um, I have a three-year-old who will soon to be in the school system. I also have a stepson who is last year's valedictorian at Douglas Freeman High School. He transferred there after eighth grade from St. Christopher's School, primarily for academics and for the greater level of diversity offered at Douglas Freeman High School. 
because of my experiences, what I know about community buildings, schools, and what I've learned from my neighbors and friends, I believe that keeping Crestview zoned through Freeman High School is best, best, does the best job in meeting the guidelines that you've set forth. Are there other ways? Of course, but as I look at other ways, they don't seem better. Um, and I, they also affect greater numbers of students. I wanna focus on two specific areas of the guidelines. Of huge concern to me is the continuity aspect and the fact that 87% of students would go from the Tuckahoe Middle School to Freeman High School if Crestview were to be zoned to Tucker. Crestview would be in the 13% that goes to Tucker. I ask you, of your friends, of your peers, if you looked at nine of them and eight of them were going somewhere different at an age like 13, 14, 15, which are very formative years, how would you feel about that? I hear people here, people who are advocating for maps that go against my neighborhood children. And this is a recurring issue in the redistricting. I don't want it for my child. I don't want it for other people's children. That's a really horrible thing to do. True, some kids choose to go to a specialty center, but they shouldn't just be ripped away after building those strong friendships in middle school years. I had never seen your slide. This is the first time I've been at a school board meeting with the right to achieve, the support to succeed, and your mission. And you have up there a little graphic icon of relationships and of people holding hands and to take these kids and rip them apart from each other after the middle school level, I don't believe supports what we as a county and what you as a school board should do. More concerning is when I look at the amazing population of Crestview, I think the fact that they're being pulled away from their friends I can't ignore the fact that that is an area with a lot more diversity, socioeconomic diversity, racial diversity, religious diversity. I think that is a really important aspect to the Freeman High School. I've studied American history all my life. Freeman High School is a beacon. It's what you should aspire to. It's not what should be changed. You can't reverse engineer it. It's really special. And Crestview is part of the fabric of that school. And I urge you to continue Crestview to Tuckahoe Middle to Freeman. Thank you. Good evening, Sean Toluchek. I have two daughters, uh, one of which is at Crestview right now, one is uh, at Tuckahoe. And I think if the board applies common sense and the facts to its own guidelines, really there's no way that you can remove Crestview, Crestview from the Freeman uh, High School. And I'll tell you why. The first one is proximity. As noted in a recent publication, Crestview is the closest to Freeman of the neighborhoods that are to be moved. In fact, many kids would have to drive past Freeman and probably watch their brothers and sisters and their best friends getting off their buses and walking into Freeman High School. Imagine doing that every day if you were a kid. It's unbelievable that we propose that. No other school is in that situation where they have to drive past the high school they thought they were going to, to go to another one. But that goes into the second criteria, safety. They're driving farther away. What happens when you drive farther? You have more of a chance to get in an accident. 10 years ago, Cropper tried to move us to Tucker. That was shot down because they deemed it wasn't safe. There was more accidents. That's the same today. There's more traffic on the roads today. Our kids from Crestview and Tuckahoe would be getting on 64 to go to school. If any of y'all have driven 64 in the morning like I have to go to work, it's a nightmare. And I cannot imagine you wanting to put 16 year old kids on that road to get to school. The third one is feeder patterns. Um, Anna Lee talked about that a little bit, but a 100% of Crestview goes to Tuckahoe right now. And 87% goes from Tuckahoe to Freeman. You cannot find continuity like that in any other schools in front of you. So why would you change that? It is completely against your guidelines that you have to follow. The fourth one is community. Our neighborhood is one of the largest, I mean, one of the oldest communities in Henrico. We're backed up against the city. We have nowhere to go behind us. We are closest to Freeman. It's been our high school and should be our high school. But here's the thing. The Crestview Tuckahoe Freeman bond has been cemented for years. All of these kids, they go to the same churches, dance classes, baseball leagues. Um, a lot of them walk from Tuckahoe to Freeman for after school activities. You can see Freeman from Tuckahoe and vice versa. How could you possibly consider breaking those kids up? 
They go from Tuckahoe, they do band, they go from Tuckahoe, and they do all sorts of things. The lacrosse community, the baseball community is so intertwined. To break these kids up to the magnitude that you're talking to, I just, I don't see it. But the main thing is, is that diversity and economic impact. It's one of the number one things you have to look at. And when you look at option D versus option E, you have no choice. Option E actually cuts the disparity between Tucker and Freeman in half. There's a 15% disparity right now. Under option E, it goes down to 7%. Option D, no change whatsoever. I cannot imagine that in 2020, we are thinking about taking this away from these kids. We also have a petition with 600 signatures I was just to give you, but I don't know. Thank you so much, sir. Next, we have John Kesson, Robert Young, and Karen Hargrove. John Kesson, Robert Young, Karen Hargrove. Are you Mr. Kesson? I am. Okay, Mr. Young, are you here? Okay, with Ms. Ms. Hargrove, can I have Mackenzie Nelson, Kyra Lambert, and me, Angel Kanda, come up? Three of you all. Are you all here? If not, can I move to Rachel Kelly? Rachel Kelly? How about Jeff Britt? All right, thank you, Mr. Britt. Yes, sir. Good evening, my name is John Kesson. I'm a longtime homeowner in Stonegate, also known as Covered Bridge. But since Cropper continues to refer to us as Stonegate, let's go with Stonegate for today. <laughs> These uh, high school redistricting maps, and uh, you know, there is one thing that seems to be missing, and it's student safety. It's uh, my first time uh, being here speaking to the full school board. Uh, I feel at this point it's the only way that our communities are going to get heard uh, despite our months-long effort of engaging on this process. What I notice uh, right up here, you know, is student safety and wellness, but when I go through the redistricting criteria, that should be number one, but it's not even on the slide. The others, as some of uh, our other community members have noted, uh, talk about relationships, which are true in all of these cases. The school board should look to limit the number of students affected by this redistricting, and it's been shown through many of these options that the cropper maps continue to affect many more students than would be required to accomplish the goals. <clears throat> when we talk about student safety, uh, I'd like to talk about how Godwin is a neighborhood school and is a safe walking distance. The uh, first handout that I, pasted, uh, I passed out is using a Cropper's GIS map to show the boundary of our uh, subdivision as well as Godwin. We can see on here that it is less than a half a mile to Godwin. That's about 800 uh, yards, so when we're watching football on Sunday, let's keep that in mind, that's about seven football fields from our addition to the high school our community has been with since 1980. High school is perhaps the most important uh, time to think and the most important maps to consider with after school activities, sports, uh, a late dismissal time, and students driving. When you're in high school, no longer do you have daycare options and after school options, which means you have the bus or you have to pick your students up from those activities. There are many uh, in our community that are single parents and obviously that presents challenges. There's a comfort when you know your children can walk home 800 yards versus 5.5 uh, miles to Tucker as proposed in well over half of these maps. Let's think about some of these roads our students are gonna be walking on under this proposal. Parham, Pemberton, Three Chop, and Gaskins. With that late dismissal time and student after school activities wrapping up in four, 4.30, 5 o'clock, 
Uh, those are very dangerous uh, roads to be on. It's not safe, it's dangerous, and it would be negligent given the proximity of Godwin to our, our addition. The proposed uh, line has been talked about, doesn't meet any of the criteria set by the school. Mr. Uh, thank you so much um, for your comments. We're gonna look at your um, documents. Thank you, sir. Hi, uh, Karen Hargrove for redistricting. I'm gonna, um, Jeff Britt is in my neighborhood. Yes, ma'am. I was on the, bat, um, the to talk about another issue but my daughter couldn't come tonight, so can you move me to next month? You, yes, ma'am, we'd be yeah. more happy to. Okay, I'm gonna give my time to him. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hargrove, um, will you write Ms. Hargrove down there? So she's gonna put you down so you don't have to re-sign up. Okay, you'll be first, how about that? All right. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mickey said that I didn't, so. Somebody's already signed up. Mr. Britt. Thank you, uh, good evening. Uh, Jeff Britt, Pinedale Farms. Um, I've got four children in Henrico schools, freshman at Douglas Freeman High School, a seventh grader and a sixth grader at Cuyacuson Middle, and a fourth grader at Jackson Davis Elementary. And I'm here this evening on behalf of the more than 600 residents that have signed a petition to keep the Pemberton Corridor at Freeman High School. The Pemberton Corridor includes eight neighborhoods with about 130 high school age kids. We currently attend Freeman, though several of the proposed rezoning options would move us to Tucker. I have a freshman, as I said, and we're fighting to stay at Freeman to preserve the community we've established there at that school. I've said this before here at this meeting, but the Pemberton Corridor was redistricted just 10 years ago. In 2009, students in our area were moved from Tuckahoe Middle to Cuyacuson Middle, and kids were also moved from Godwin to Freeman. This impacted close to 300 students along the Pemberton Corridor. Now, here we are again, facing another round of redistricting and potentially a third high school in just 10 years. So when does it stop? I've lived along Pemberton Road for 12 years and this is my third redistricting fight. Our area is always up for grabs, it seems. In fact, here's a preview of coming attractions. The five-year capital spending plan the school board just passed back in November calls for the full replacement of two schools in our area and a proposed brand new elementary school in the West End. My younger kids attend Jackson Davis and Cuyacuson. That's two of the five schools that are slated to be replaced. And it appears the newly proposed West End Elementary School may impact our area too. According to a January 25th Richmond Times-Dispatch article, in, in speaking to the Henrico Board of Supervisors regarding the school system's capital plan, Dr. Cashwell said, quote, the tentative plans to build another elementary school in Western Henrico beginning in 2022-23 could be delayed several years if the Jackson Davis Elementary replacement is built with additional capacity. This tells me the new school is located nearby and guaranteed that brand new school or a big, bigger Jackson Davis will surely impact the Pemberton Corridor again and trigger another round of redistricting. Overall, I believe the process is flawed and misguided. We are moving too fast and arbitrary decisions are being made that will impact thousands of students and families. I question the rationale to intentionally disrupt thousands of students just to fill 32 seats at Tucker, especially when county data shows enrollment trends are down at Freeman and at many high schools. Why are we so intent to fix a problem that isn't broken? We can fix it, we can do better. We should focus and prioritize limiting the number of student disruptions through this redistricting. So far, only map D does this. Most recently, high school options D1 and D2, which were released yesterday. The Pemberton Corridor supports the D options because it limits those disruptions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Britt. Next, we'll have Corey Payne, Bill Archmoody, and Del Cherie Shines. Del Cherie Shines? Okay, thank you. Uh, next, in her place, Emily Folsom. No, Emily Folsom. One more time, Ms. Folsom. Okay. Yes, sir. Are we good? Yes, sir. So my name is Corey Payne. Um, I've been a resident of Henrico County since I was born in 1977. Uh, I went to Longan Elementary School, Tucker Middle School, and Tucker High School, so I know the area. 
What I want to talk about is the fact that I have four children. I live in the Church Run neighborhood, which is right down the street from Pocahontas. Um, it is statistically the closest public school to our neighborhood, and every uh, of the first four and three of the next four that came out yesterday have us moving to Koyakasan, which takes us from about a, less than a mile away to over three miles away. I thought we were going to talk about sort of kind of what's been going on, but I've heard a lot of things today. I want to change this speech up a little bit. When we started this, they released the five sort of criteria of this is how we're going to draw the lines, right? That's what we knew. However, when these first started coming out, they talked about major roads and natural boundaries. Fail. We're being split by some random overflow waterway that one of my friends said was nuts, right? That's kind of what's going on. The next one was geographic zones. Church Run and Windsor Place are two neighboring neighborhoods. They are connected by walkways. They share a, a, resource, a rec center. We're being split up. There's a, the judicial uh, guidelines. While not appropriate here, one of the problems is, is that we vote at Pocahontas Middle School. That's where the county says we are the closest and we're being pulled away. The established walking schools, as you heard earlier, three chops being expanded. They put a walkway there to have us walk there. Now we're being moved away. School bus transportation. I went to Tucker. I know what that subdivision looks like driving down 64. You're not going to go down 64. You're going to go down Three Chopped, go down Parham, where there are thousands and thousands of cars. You don't have to go anywhere to, to get to Godwin. You have one turn. Now we're going down two major uh, roadways, going through Gaskins, train wreck. Now you have buses. Now you have 16-year-olds driving there, too. Does not seem like the right thing to do. So here's what I put to you. As we look at what has been put out there, there's criteria. As you look at these criteria, almost every single one of these things fails, every single criteria. We've been told to trust the process. The process is not working. When everything that shows up shows that there's something else being driven, whether it's not being communicated or something else is out there, it shows a lack of transparency, it shows a lack of commitment, and it freaks everyone out. And that's why you hear this going on. So I'd like for you all to take a second, look at what's going on, and don't allow the GIS group from Ohio to overrun what is known and the people that are here that know a little bit better. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bill Ockmoody. I'm from the Bell Tower neighborhood. Um, I had planned to play this in just a minute, but I'm going to play it on the back of that. This is Bill Pike questioning this very process. Redistricting. Uh, this seems to be a very familiar template that, that school systems follow, okay? Uh, and I'm just asking, is, is there anything else out there? Uh, because redistricting, all it does is create heartburn. It creates heartburn for the school board. It creates heartburn for uh, the staff members that are working through it. It probably creates heartburn for the people that will be on the committee. And I'm, I'm really, I, uh, and, it, and I know if you don't have an answer, that's fine. But I, I'm just wondering, what else is out there? I mean, is there... I suspect most of my neighbors and friends feel the same way. This is ridiculous. 2009, 16,000 pieces of communication came into the community, from the community to the board to the county, saying, this is broken. This doesn't work. And yet, here we are with the same contractor, 10 years later, having the same arguments over the same boundary lines. This is insane. Mr. Cropper stood before this board back in 2009, waved a piece of paper and said, look at us and how great we did. And the board said, thank you, Mr. Cropper. Very nice job. Thank you, committee members. Very nice job. You guys go along now. And immediately went into debate on how to fix the damn maps. That's crazy that we are here again today with the same thing. You know what else is crazy? The maps propose moving 5,000 students. I reworked the map today. I sent you guys an email. Cropper's numbers changed from, January, from December, November, September, October. His numbers changed. It was 302 when we started the process in the entire county to keep every middle school and high school at 94%. We are now at 439 students, not 5,000. Please, for the love of God, step in and stop this process.
Dr. Cooper, and members of the board, I appreciate the opportunity to speak you, to you this evening. I have lived in my wonderful neighborhood, Magnolia Ridge, for 15 years. My children are both students at Hungry Creek Middle School, an eighth grader and a sixth grader. I have been a pediatric clinical social worker for over 20 years and served children and families in many capacities. I am also a single mother with children who split their time between two homes. Caring for children, both personally and professionally, is my life's work. Dr. Cooper, this redistricting process has been incredibly frustrating for me. As our representative, I implore you to consider my comments and those of my neighbors. My eighth grader is being groomed for Glen Allen High School marching band and wrestling team for the feeder pattern transition for high school. But I continue to see no map or no option for him to stay at Glen Allen High School outside of option Z. He will be a rising 10th grader in 2021, which means he will have to do one year at Glen Allen High School and then start at Hermitage High School as a 10th grader. My sixth grader will be an eighth grader in, in 2021 and will be able to benefit from grandfathering, but I will have to transport her. That is a hardship for a single mother that works full time downtown. And it's a hardship for many families that do not have the means to transport their children daily. I'm concerned about the impact of redistricting and the stress it will place on young children and teenagers. Dr. Cashwell, in your co-written article on January 26th in the Richmond Times-Dispatch, you said that Henrico is striving to build, uh, build support systems for mental health and trauma-informed care. How is this your focus with a redistricting effort that will impact so many lives? We understand overcrowding and growing communities. However, in a county as richly funded as Henrico, certainly the board can uncover a solution limiting the number of children impacted by this effort. Our, com our community deserves to stay together. Our children need to remain in their current schools. Our neighborhoods are richly, rich with diversity. We support and enhance our community schools, Greenwood, Hungry Creek, and Glen Allen, and, and we are a community. I urge you to consider dis delaying redistricting, and if, not, if that is not possible, support option Z, limiting the disruption of students. I leave you with these thoughts. What about the tax dollars I'm paying while I'm transporting my child? Did you know that children who switch schools after eighth grade tend to have lower school engagement, poorer grades, and higher risk, dropping, a higher risk of dropping out of high school altogether? Did you know that students who move schools tend to be antisocial, shy, or withdrawn and have less classroom participation? Have you factored in the need for additional counseling for students that are negatively impacted by this redistricting? Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. <laughs> Next, we'll have Laura Johnson, Courtney Kuster, and John Buckby. Hello, my name is Laura Johnson and I'm here to talk about redistricting and Ridge Elementary. I have two daughters who go to Ridge and I'm the PTA president there. Ridge is an amazing school where the teachers and staff are unbelievably dedicated, talented, and nurturing. When you walk into the school, you can just feel its warmth and the sense of community. And that community is a truly global one. Our student population consists of children with many different ethnicities, religions, and languages. More than 17 are spoken by our students. In addition to that, Ridge is also socioeconomically diverse. It's a Title I school with about 92% of the children eligible for free and reduced lunch. This is by far the highest percentage compared to the nearby elementary schools and is one of the highest percentages in the whole county. And I'm here to ask you to prioritize this aspect of Ridge while you proceed through the redistricting process. Of the maps that came out yesterday, Maps D1 and 2 would actually increase the percentage of poverty at school, going against the fourth goal of reducing concentrations of poverty while balancing community or neighborhood school concepts. These maps further concentrate and increase poverty at Ridge by moving the neighborhood behind Freeman High School to Tuckahoe Elementary, and I don't see an overarching benefit there. 
uh, moving that neighborhood re would reduce Ridge's population by about 40 students, but that minor capacity gain isn't worth the burden it would create. Given the demographics of that um, neighborhood, it would increase the concentration of poverty at Ridge, and it would also take away a good portion of the school's PTA, which provides vital volunteer and financial resources to a school that greatly depends on them. The work that our neighborhood volunteers do um, enhances the intellectual enrichment of our students, of your students, and Ridge depends on these resources. So what's the county's honest priority with regard to Ridge, and what directive are you giving to the redistricting committee? The committee's discussions have focused more on capacity, transportation, and feeder patterns than on economics, and when it comes to Ridge, that's a backward prioritization. So I'm asking you to please consider, consider whether it's worth it to reduce a school like Ridge's volunteer force and resources and increase its economically disadvantaged percentage just to reduce the student population by about two children per class. Why make a change that would have such a small effect on capacity but such a big effect on resources and demographics? Looking at it this way, it appears that resources are being concentrated at certain schools in this part of the county through socioeconomic districting and the corresponding supplemental resources that come from parent organizations, while other schools are left more vulnerable. And that's what's happening with Ridge, and it's not right. If you go with maps D1 or 2, the need at Ridge is going to become even greater. But before it comes to that, I hope the school board will not allow further segregation of this part of the county. So please don't allow changes that would set Ridge and its community back. Please do everything in your power to help it flourish. Thank you. Thank you. I want to, can, can you all stand back up again who represent Ridge so we can just see you all again if you could? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Courtney Kuster. I live in the Charles Glenn neighborhood. Um, we are labeled as Crestview on the subdivision maps, but we actually are three separate neighborhoods within that area. Um, I ditto everything that's been said by every community, and I really do think, I'm changing my whole statement, this is a flawed process. Um, we've been through this before, uh, like other neighborhoods. We've been picked apart by rezoning, construction. We are the neighborhood that had Walmart built in our beautifully forested Reynolds development area that's on historic maps. Um, we worked with the county, we worked with planning, we worked with the supervisors. We made the best community we could up against that. Um, currently, Fort Hill, which is part of Crestview Elementary, is being chipped into to build a storage facility. Part of that was um, by right, part of that was rezoned and homes were removed, so now these cute, small, lower income homes are across the street from a dirt pile that's gonna be a storage facility. I feel like every time something, someone decides something needs to be changed, either it's a numbers game or it's in the name of business, the Crestview Elementary area gets, gets chipped away at. Um, we have formed tight bonds with Tuckahoe Elementary, our feeder school, and with Freeman Elementary. We've spoken about that with um, band, with our lacrosse, with football. We see Pemberton as our family. They're part of our football family at Freeman. I don't want to be pitted against my neighbors and my community. I shop with these neighbors. I worship with these neighbors. I exercise with these neighbors. I do volunteerism with these neighbors. And it runs the entire length of Three Chop. You need to reconsider how this is done. It is antiquated and it is wrong. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Buckby, and I'm with the uh, Pemberton Corridor. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about big picture concerns and, and small picture concerns. Big picture, kind of hit on a couple of points that have already been said, but there's only a few schools, elementary, none in middle, and just a few in high school that are over capacity, and yet most maps redraw the boundaries for 20 of our 45 elementaries and all of our middles and all of our highs. I think we're overdoing it. I think the committee is, is quite simply solving a problem that's disproportionate 
um, to what this problem is. Furthermore, the analysis looks by today's grade levels, 9 through 12, cuts them all up, and then redistributes them, and that's the analysis that we see. But that's not what's going to be in schools two years from now. Do you know which grade is currently our largest? It's our ninth graders, 4,200. But they're exempt from this. this. The classes that follow that, kindergarten through fifth, all average 3,700 students, 500 less. So we are now designing new redistricting maps for the smallest classes that will be using them in just a few years from now. We'll probably be here again. That's my big picture concerns. My small picture concerns relate to analysis that I don't see happening by the committees. We see feeders from elementary to middle, we see feeders from middle to high. I was curious what the elementary to high feeder was. So I took the material from the most recent January 7th maps, the C's and the D's, and I traced out every feeder pattern from elementaries to highs. For the 46 schools, 16 of those elementary schools split to two high schools. 30 of them go to one high school. That's what you'd want. You'd want one elementary school in part to go in whole, in whole to one high school. 16 go to two. One elementary school goes to three high schools on all of these maps except for the Ds, and that's Pemberton Elementary. Pemberton Elementary is one of the smallest schools in all of Henrico, it's 284. Let me put a finer point on that. Last year, the fifth grade class was 42 kids. That means that every map except for D1 and D2 is gonna take 14 kids, send 14 to Tucker, 14 to Godwin, and 14 to Freeman. Or if you don't think it splits evenly, then it's gonna be six here, and eight here, and 30 there. I don't think that our intentions to redistribute um, the county should ride on the backs of 42 kids. My concern here is twofold, that a lack of foresight will cause us to make many more changes than are necessary while also necessitating the need for us to do this again, engaging more consultants just a few years from now, and that number two, these changes are gonna fall on the backs of some of our smallest communities, like the fifth graders from Pemberton Elementary who will be headed to three different high schools. I urge this board not to let that happen. Thank you for your time and your service to this county. Thank you, Ms. Buckley. Next, we'll have Graham Rushkind, Rashkind, uh, Keith Lipper, and Lindsey Stone. Mr. Rashkind? Yes. Okay. Is, is that Mr. Lipper? Okay. Okay. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Graham Rashkind. I'm here to show support for the Pemberton Corridor. I currently support options D and option two, which keep our neighborhoods at Freeman High School. My wife and I have been residents of Henrico County for 18 years. We lived in the same house in Candlewood. Candlewood's a small neighborhood along Pemberton Road. Our neighborhood sits between Three Chopped Road and Quiocatson Road along the Pemberton Corridor, and it's bordered by Gaskins Road to the west. We have been through this process three times in the 18 years we've lived in our house. Technically, in the last 12 years, we've been through this redistricting process. The last time, our school board representative helped define those roads, those roadways, as hard boundaries for these school districts with the promise of permanence. We were told, look, we're taking you out of Godwin High School, but we're going to get you into Freeman, and, and that's where you're going to be. And so we've spent the last 10 years investing uh, our time, energy, resources, everything we had in building a community with the other families at Freeman High School. And now, just 10 years later, we're looking at options that move us into the Tucker High School District. We're being asked to start over again. We're being asked to get with the plan, to make a change. That was the same thing we were asked last time. And I just come here tonight concerned that we'll be back here in five years, six years, 10 years, doing it again. My problem isn't with redistricting, that, that may be what we have to do to get things right. My hope is that you as a school board will take it upon yourselves to get it right. It doesn't seem like we've done that the last few times out. If my car breaks down, I take it to a mechanic. If it keeps breaking down, I take it to a new mechanic. It seems like we're going back to the same place to try and solve our problems, and we're not getting better. I have a child at, in fourth grade at Pemberton Elementary. I have a child who's an 11th grader at Freeman High School, and I have a child who's an eighth grader at Cuyacas Middle School. 
He's the one who'll be most affected by this timeline. He's gonna spend eighth grade at Cuyahocas in freshman year at Freeman High School, and he's gonna spend uh, his next year he's gonna possibly go to Tucker. That's three schools in three years. That's not fair to these children. It's not easy to be a child. It's certainly not easy to get into college. These kids need stability, they need continuity, they need the opportunity to build relationships with counselors, coaches, their peers, their relationships. We need to make sure that the school board supports that, that you have the oversight on this committee who's drawing these boundaries, who's redistricting, and make sure the four cornerstones that are up there are actually being taken into consideration. There are so many questions we've got to ask. You need to ask yourself about the capital improvements that are coming to Jackson Davis and Cuyahocas and in all the other schools that deserve attention. I came here tonight thinking I'd be surrounded by an angry mob. I think it's exciting to see how much passion everybody has for their schools. They want to stay. We should all have the chance to really take a hard look at how we're doing this, and we need your help to do that. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Keith Lippa. I represent a group of small neighborhoods located on the northwest side of Staples Mill and Hungry Roads that are part of Glen Allen's Cross Ridge community. We are currently zoned for Longan Elementary, Hungry Creek Middle, and Glen Allen High School. We are here today advocating for our elementary school to be changed to Echo Lake and for our middle and high school to remain the same, Hungry Creek and Glen Allen, as most of the options currently propose. We feel strongly that Staples Mill and Hungry Roads should serve as a clear, consistent boundary at all three school levels. Doing so would have the least overall impact to students and would meet all of the redistricting guidelines and criteria set forth. It would use major roadways as boundaries as Staples Mill and Hungary are both four lane major roadways with medians. It would keep our contiguous geographic zone on the northwest corner of Staples Mill and Hungary intact, keeping our subdivisions with the rest of the Cross Ridge community. It would support safe, efficient transportation, allowing only safe right hand turns from our neighborhoods in order to deliver our children to and from school. It would support reasonable walking zones as many of our students can walk to Hungry Creek and Glen Allen if desired without crossing any major roadways. Finally, it would keep our, our children's K through 12 progress intact as it does today and consistent with feeder patterns of our surrounding communities. Currently, we are the only subdivision on the northwest side of Staples Mill and Hungry Road that do not attend Echo Lake. While our current school of Longin is at or approaching capacity, Echo Lake is only at 77% utilization and trending downward. Echo Lake has plenty of room to receive our children while simultaneously providing relief to Longin, which is a win-win for everyone. Additionally, from a middle and high school perspective, since we would remain at Hungry Creek and Glen Allen, there would be no adverse or negative effects to any other students. Most of the current options propose these three schools for us. However, there are a few that do not. Option B and high school option D concern us greatly as they violate the county's redistricting guidelines in many ways. These two options place the boundary line in our backyard instead of using the major roadway in our front yard. These options carve us out from our Cross Ridge community, create undesirable feeder pattern splits, and pull us across major roadways to dangerous intersections in order to deliver our children to and from school. Mr. Cropper's most recent data specifically call out these two options, how they create inequitable feeder pattern splits. For instance, in high school option D, only our small group of children are the only ones that would be redistricted from Hungry Creek to Hermitage, creating a 96 to 4% feeder pattern split, not the 50-50 or 60-40, which is desired. By using Hungry Road and Staples Mill as the clear, consistent boundary at all three school levels, all of the above issues would be addressed, and all of the redistricting guidelines and objectives given by the school board would be met. We ask that you keep these important points in mind as edits to the maps continue as you make your final decisions in May. On behalf of myself and my neighbors I represent, we sincerely thank you for your time and dedication to serving the needs of all students in Henrico County. Thank you. Can I pass this on? My name is Lindsay Stone, and I am a parent at Ridge Elementary. I'm part of the Ridge Tuckahoe Freeman Coalition that some of you have heard about, and that's my posse. <laughs> so I, I agree with everything that I've heard tonight, and I understand that redistricting is very difficult and painful. 
I grew up in the 70s in Atlanta, Georgia, when desegregation had happened and people were being moved around from schools there. I know that this is a painful process, but we're relying on you to get this right. I really believe that we have to get on top of Cropper and the mess that he's making with our schools right now. So let me get to reading. Um, the issue with uh, our school, Ridge Elementary, is um, a socioeconomic one. It um, adheres to the, to the part of the, um, the process that was supposed to be about um, decentralizing the poverty at certain schools. And we're clearly not doing that. In fact, we're over concentrating poverty at Ridge right now. Um, Laura did so, such a beautiful uh, explanation of how Ridge exists. We're a multicultural, global community. We have 20 plus languages spoken there. Um, and we have a very devoted group of about 10 women who help keep our PTA together. Half of that PTA is going to be ripped apart from our school with the redistricting. Every time we turn around, half of our PTA is being ripped apart. Why? Well, because Ridge Elementary has about four or five large um, uh, socioeconomically struggling apartments that are fed into our school. And they're wonderful. The kids are great. We do everything that we can to provide what all the other schools are able to easily provide their schools. Um, but we are challenged to do that because we don't have the money. We don't have the parent power and we don't have um, the parent support. We do the best that we can. Um, there are a small amount of neighborhoods that enclose about less 100 students at a school that has over 500 students. And all of those neighborhoods are what are being redistricted away from Ridge. So you take 40 students from, um, from Ridge Elementary and give them to Tuckahoe Elementary. Tuckahoe Elementary doesn't need those resources. Ridge needs those resources. Um, what I've found over the 15 years that I've had children at Ridge, and I'm gonna be there a little bit longer, is that, um, is that we don't have the guts to take some of the uh, impoverished areas and move them to other schools. Um, Mayberry won't take them. Pemberton won't take them. Uh, Pinchbeck won't take them. Davis won't take them. We embrace them, we love them, we want them. But if we want everyone to thrive in an equitable form, then you need to spread out the poverty levels in the area of Henrico. That is a West End. This is a school that sits right between Freeman and Tuckahoe Middle School. These are wealthy schools. This is your job. We need you to do your job. Cropper's not doing your job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Next, we'll have Chantel Lewis, Colleen Savino, and Stu Danforth. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Chantel Lewis, and as a provider and a parent of a teen that attends Verona High School, I see the changes in the trends and disparities that plague our teens, especially as it relates to their health. Studies have shown over the past few years that there are several unhealthy trends plaguing our teens to include poor nutrition, obesity, poor hearing health, opioid, and drug abuse, and lastly, mental health instability. According to the National Alliance of Mental Illness, 50% of all lifetime mental illnesses are developed by the age of 14. The CDC reported that the obesity prevalence is 20.6% amongst 12 to 19 year olds. As per the Hearing Loss Association of America, 12.5% of kids between the ages of 6 and 19 have hearing loss as a result of listening to loud music, particularly through earbuds at unsafe volumes. Unfortunately, these trends are in disproportionate numbers and have led to disparities in various communities, to include those involving teens that attend Henrico County Public Schools. 
Teens at HCPS are provided limited information regarding these trends throughout the school year, most of which might come from their health and PE classes. But that is not enough, because if it was, we would not see these increasing numbers and unhealthy trends among teens. We expect personnel at HCPS to develop and administer resources and programs for our teens related to unhealthy trends. However, for example, many guidance counselors take on large workloads, including working on 504 plans that most other school districts don't allow for their guidance counselors to work on. And because of this, this causes our guidance counselors to limit the time that they can provide to our teens with the tools that they need for mental health education, identifying mental health problems, and assisting students to prevent a mental health crisis. The health and PE teachers, as per their curriculum, can only spend but so much time educating teens on the proper amount of physical activity and obesity while in school. Therefore, I feel that HCPS needs to provide supplementary information and programs in the beginning of the school year to assist these personnel while educating our teens. Therefore, I would like to present the board with my idea of a Henrico County Public Schools Teen Health Week that focuses on the trends, epidemics, and disparities that are common in our teens. This week will involve all teachers, administrators, staff, parents, and the community. We can arm our teens with the necessary resources in a way that reaches them in September during the beginning of the school year. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I hate to cut you off, but no, what, that's what fine. we're going to do, Dr. Cashwell just informed me mm -hmm. that she's going to have a staff member reach out to you and follow up. Okay, and I left in just the proposals for you guys to read and some information. Thank you so right, much. Thank you. thank you so much. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell. My name is Colleen Savino, and I teach at Hermitage High School. In my life, teaching has been a light. It has been inspiration and joy and creativity. It pulses within me, fills me, nourishes me. It is me. When I stand in front of a classroom full of kids, something ignites. It sparks. The light becomes fire. And with it, anything is possible. Without it, nothing is. I have carried this torch for 24 years. 24 years of pure love for what I do sitting at games in the freezing cold, staying after school just to talk to a student, seeing the light in others when the lesson finally clicks, lending a shoulder to cry on, leading clubs and activities, learning from mistakes, gaining from experiences, knowing when I've failed, letting students know it's okay to fail, building esteem, breaking barriers, I don't have numbers for these things. I don't have data, no pie chart or graph to show you. I just have the light within me. But that light is growing dim. It grows dim because of lesson plans and unit plans and SOLs and tasks and growth measurements and meetings and benchmarks and action teams and observations. It is stifled every time that I am told to do something that will never serve my students. When I'm given direction with no direction, when I'm given rules without the rationale, when I'm given wrongs without reason, when I'm given and given and given and given and nothing is ever taken away. When I'm screaming for help without an ear listening. The brokenness needs to be fixed. The mandatings need to stop. The leaders need to hear. Teachers are tired. It's hard to keep burning without the fuel. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Stu Danforth and I live on Pepper Tree Drive in the Pemberton Corridor. I'm here with a bunch of my neighbors. My family has lived here for 14 years and currently have two children at Freeman and one at Queoxin Middle School. We strongly endorse keeping Pemberton Corridor at Freeman High School for several reasons. 
We were redistricted from Godwin High School to Freeman High School during the last redistricting 10 years ago. While we opposed the move from, Fre from Godwin to Freeman at the time, we spent the last 10 years becoming ingrained in the Freeman community and feel strongly that another move would be unfairly disruptive. It would be our third high school in 10 years. It doesn't make sense to send our children to a high school that is further away from two other schools. In addition, this creates the need for those children to travel on much busier roads, Parham Road and Interstate 64, while our students can currently walk to Freeman High School. If forced to move to Tucker, many along the Pemberton Corridor will now have two schools outside of their voting district. In addition, there are roughly 130 high school-aged students along the Pemberton Corridor. It's far less than the number of students being moved from Tucker to Glen Allen and Hermitage combined. And Henrico County Public Schools data shows that many of these options impact thousands of students in the West End just to fill an additional 32 seats at Tucker High School. Every effort should be made to limit the unnecessary impact to students. That's why we support high school options D1 and D2. And on a personal note, I, I have two sons who've spent five years in school together between Pemberton Elementary and Creoxton Middle School. And under some of the current options, what we'd be forced to recognize is that these, these two brothers who are best friends would potentially spend two years going to separate high schools, going to football games, to rival high schools, that just doesn't make any sense. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Danforth. Next we'll have Timothy St. George, Whitney Fogg, and Michelle Vanderland. Mr. St. George? Yes, sir. Before you start speaking. Okay, sir, it's on you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman, members of the board. I'm Timothy St. George. I'm with the Crestview Area Coalition. I echo the concerns of a number of people that have expressed macroscopic issues with the process. I, too, feel that we're using a sledgehammer to solve problems where a scalpel would do. I urge the board to seriously consider the impacts that are being uh, proffered by Mr. Cropper and his company and to minimize the impact on students overall. Moving away from my bigger picture concerns, I did want to talk about the maps that were released just yesterday and a couple of the options. Not because I agree with them, but because they are the current proposals on the table with a seemingly never-ending stream of maps. Maps D and E, options one and two, both move, all move thousands of students in an unnecessary way. However, if forced to choose, I would urge the board to consider moving the fewest students possible. I want the board to look at these numbers and realize that behind every single number is a person and that moving students has been shown through academic studies to cause anxiety and depression and, and diminish school performance. If forced to choose between the current options, options D move more students generally than option E. And option E2, for instance, moves 700 fewer students than option D1. All things being equal, there's a clear preference for the maps being drawn up in option E and E2 specifically. Another point that has not been made uh, so far is the stated goal for redistricting. One of the four goals was to increase uh, and to account for the increased capacity at Tucker High School. When we look at options D and E, options E accomplish that far more uh, straightforwardly than options D. Tucker High School currently has 1,672 individuals enrolled. Options D1 uh, and D2 increase that to 1791 and 1685, respectively. Options E1 and E2 increase that to 1856, both with the same number. So therefore, you see an increase of approximately 150 students through Tucker. If that's one of our stated goals of redistricting, then why would we not be considering the options that move more students to Tucker? And under the current versions of those maps, that's option E. Moving away from those two maps, I do want to talk a little bit specifically about Crestview in particular. Crestview is a small and geographically bounded community that will not grow. And the maps that have been proposed by Mr. Cropper simply are not accounting for natural geographic boundaries or major interstates and roads. There's no reason to move the small Crestview Monumental Floral Gardens community into another feeder pattern. 
especially when doing so would cause the most efficient way to get to Tucker High School to be on I-64 or to alternatively bypass Freeman High and to wave to all their uh, prior friends and classmates on the way there. Options E as compared to options D also favor diversity and Crestview is an important feeder school to the diversity of Freeman and that should not be changed. Thank you for your time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. My name is Whitney Fogg. I live on Michael Road in the Three Chop District, and I have two children at Ridge Elementary. I have one at Tuckahoe Middle. I served as the PTA president at Ridge from 2017 to 2019. Now I'm the vice president of programs and still a very involved volunteer. I fear the redistricting committee and the consultant really haven't truly heard our concerns about Ridge. Several options are moving some of the single family homes to other elementary schools, I assume to deal with the overcrowding, and I get it. We've got three trailers, we hover at about 99 to 103% capacity, so I understand why that number is favorable when you're looking at just numbers and just in that scope. What they're not understanding is the potential impact to the school of moving even a small portion of those homes. Ridge has a 92% free and reduced lunch rate. It's so high, we've had free breakfast and lunch there for the past two years. The county has concentrated a large underserved population into one school and given no additional resources with which to deal with that population. Fortunately, the community and wonderful staff and administration have stepped up and filled a void. Most of the community volunteers live in the single family homes around the school, some of which are being proposed to be moved to other schools. They provide committee, community members, volunteers, funding, additional resources, and removing any of those single family homes removes volunteers and financial support from Ridge. Removing any of those single family homes increases the poverty rate, which is contrary to one of the stated goals of this process to deconcentrate poverty. Truly the best solution, but one that no one wants to discuss, is maybe looking at one of those apartment complexes. If no one's willing to volunteer to have that conversation, then just leave us alone. Please leave the boundaries. We'd rather be slightly overcrowded than underfunded. The school is a special place that succeeds due to a delicate balance of many factors and any imbalance could have a cascading effect which could be very negative. Uh, no action should ever be taken that could jeopardize our students' success. As the redistricting process completes or continues on, I hope you'll take seriously the charge to reduce concentrations of poverty. In situations where that's not possible, I hope you at least won't increase them. Thank you for your time and for keeping Ridge top of mind as you consider all of the possible options. Thank you. Hi, thank you. My name is Michelle Vandelen and I too am here to talk about the redistricting. I live in the West End of Henrico and I have for 42 years. I have two kids who currently attend Pocahontas and so I have some skin in this game. I live in the Stonegate neighborhood, which is just under a mile from Godwin High School. I'm another concerned and quite frankly angry parent, just as frustrated as the others you've heard from tonight. Feeling like my voice doesn't matter and the criteria that Cropper has been using to make these decisions has nothing to do with common sense. As, I men as mentioned before, safety was not even listed as one of the criteria that was looked at and I'm appalled. If we are moved from Godwin to Tucker, these kids who will be new drivers, mind you, will have to navigate four to five major intersections or even worse, Interstate 64. One of the criteria that was looked at was making sure that these kids would not be redistricted multiple times, yet my kids have already been affected the last time the redistricting happened. If nothing else, please see that there are valid concerns spoken tonight and that the process has been flawed from the beginning. Cropper has no skin in this game and shouldn't be left to make decisions for you that affect us. Please pause this process and look at closely at making sure that you're listening to your community. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Next, we'll have Jim Namarato, Katrina Canoto Wash, Walsh, Larissa Rodriguez. Yes, sir. You may begin. Good evening. My name is Jim Namorato. I live in the Pemberton Corridor. I'm here tonight um, to start by saying that I currently back proposals D1 and D2. That said, I'm not even sure why we are even talking about full-blown redistricting again. We did this 10 years ago. The process, this process is not something that any sh county should have to go through over and over and over again. 10 years ago, our neighborhood and much of the Pemberton corridor went through a rezoning from Godwin to Freeman, and another move to another high school will be our small corridor's third high school in 10 years. Over the past 10 years, our neighbors and their children have worked hard to create a community with each other and within Freeman. We've built new connections, grown to know the teachers and the administrators, and now we're facing another move. And because we're a small cog in a small piece in this county, it appears that we are gonna be the cog that has moved over and over again. 10 years ago, our community was told that this would not happen again, and yet now, here we are. Our county is undergoing massive growth. There are a number of major development projects that are greatly going to affect the county school districts over the next two to five years. These projects alone, we're talking about thousands of housing units, thousands. So my question is why now? Why is the county set on going through this process now? If some or all of these new developments are not, have not, or will not be considered in this process, then I'm very concerned that we're gonna be sitting here again in five to seven years and our small community will probably be fighting its fourth change in 15 years. So I go back to my question, why now? With so much uncertainty, why has the county not put a stop to this? If there are severe needs to be addressed because of overcrowding in a small number of schools, why is the county not doing small, strategic, focused moves that will not disrupt thousands of families and their children. Please, please rethink the timing of this. Please rethink the need to drastically redefine our school districts. Our community, our entire community, our county, and what I've heard tonight, wants continuity, not just our Pemberton Corridor. Our entire county wants continuity. That is the consistent theme that I have heard tonight. We want relationships that we have built to continue. We want our kids to have the support of their peers that they have grown up with. Thank you very much for your time and for your consideration. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Thank you for your time this evening. My name is Katrina Cronodal Walsh, and I am here to talk about the danger of ignoring transportation risks in redistricting, not just for my neighborhood, which is the church run community, but for everyone in this room tonight and beyond. My professional background for more than 20 years is in transportation safety and security, homeland security, risk, threat, and vulnerability, vulnerable, vulnerability assessment. The most important lesson I have learned from working with hundreds of state, local, and federal officials is that whenever we can, we must make every effort to think about consequences, to reduce risks, and to address safety and security gaps. This is particularly true when it comes to our children. Before I move on to my other prepared remarks, I wanna add that yesterday I was in the hallway of my daughter's elementary school when over the loudspeaker we heard, this is not a drill, lock and teach. This is not a drill. Our children are already facing myriad risks and not only training for those risks, but experiencing not a drill moments. You cannot train to be in a bus accident or a car accident. Injuries and deaths happen in split seconds. Transportation is the riskiest part of the day for our children. 
3,000 school bus injuries occur nearly every year. There are more than 1,200 fatalities between 08 and 17, and car accidents are the number one cause of teen deaths, with 2,364 deaths and 300,000 teens treated in ERs in 2017 alone. The county and HCPS are ignoring their number one most important duty in this process, and that is the safety of every single child in Henrico. Safety was ignored in the request for proposal on a project that inherently involves changes in transportation and impacts to emergency management. Safety was ignored in the statement of work for Matthew Cropper. Safety was ignored in the criteria for committee members. And safety and security are repeatedly ignored in verbal and written warnings from numerous informed members of the public. HCPS, Cropper GIS, and the county are ignoring that proposed options increase distances two, three, and four times, increase speed limits, increase average daily traffic volume, increase the number of intersections, and increase routes with higher accident rates. I am asking that each of you today make it your duty to ensure that safety is no longer ignored. Eliminate the options that have these multitudinous transportation safety problems. God forbid that an accident does happen and our children become just another number like the ones I rattled off. The list of major settlements with school districts is growing and any personal injury lawyer worth, worth their salt will use the repeated verbal and written warnings about safety risks and data supplied to you all to make a significant case. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, ma'am. Hi again, my name is Larissa Rodriguez, a 34 year resident of the Verina District. I've been attending every school board meeting and every secondary committee meeting since I became aware of the redistricting process in October of 2019. I'm here again to speak because I have legitimate concerns about this process, which will have a profound impact on my family and our neighboring communities. I know that everyone has heard and continues to hear the words River Mill expressed at every meeting. My family and I plan to move to River Mill when our home is completed in 2021, and along with Greenwood Glen and Magnolia Ridge, our communities are drastically impacted by this project. And although we attend and speak at committee meetings, we've emailed county representatives, we've spoken to many of you on the school board, it feels like our voices are falling on deaf ears, and I personally feel like my concerns about the biased statements vocalized by several of the secondary committee members have been dismissed and essentially ignored. At every secondary committee meeting I have attended, River Mill is discussed in a negative, prejudicial, and biased way. For example, when it was discussed about expanding Hungry Creek Middle School, a secondary committee member made the comment, why should we give those people what they want? Who are those people? Me, my family, my neighbors? And this sentiment was echoed by two to three others. When there are a third of the committee members lacking in attendance at the meeting, this definitely shows me the odds are not in our favor to keep us in our currently zoned school district. This bias and inattentiveness to our concerns is also clearly reflected in every single map option, which doesn't even offer us a single opportunity to stay in our current zone. All I can see as a result of this redistricting process is ugliness, slander on social media, negativity, anger, divisiveness within a community I've grown up in. I'm supposed to feel trust in the process. I'm supposed to feel that those chosen to represent us on the committee are making the best equitable decisions possible. When I'm being called those people or rich people or them as if to imply we're not a part of this community, I cannot feel confident in the decisions being made. The growth of the population in Henrico County is of no surprise. Our county continues to grow and will continue to grow. Since I graduated high school in 2001, we've seen an approximate 57,000 increase in our population. I'm willing to bet that many of us parents would rally together to come up with a better solution than to face this horrible redistricting process again in another few years. Let's come up with a more creative solution, one that unites our community, not sets us against each other. Thank you.
My name is Nathan Lash and I live in the monumental floral gardens, Willow Lawn area. And we too have been through this redistricting process 10 years ago. It's sad to see the anger and frustration in some of the comments from our neighbors in Henrico County during this redistricting sessions and online. Some are very insensitive and, and driven by the perception of decreased property values and other fallacies. No one wants to move, no one wants to leave their friends, no one wants to divide communities or have new teammates. This process and the lack of consistent transparency and explanation of explanations is truly driving people crazy. It's not about a possible 10 minute walk, hearing a band, how loud of, or vocal a group is, or homemade maps. Safety and balance should be the main concern of these children if they have to move schools or boundaries have to be altered. Having a daughter in the eighth grade at Tuckahoe Middle and my son at fourth grade at Crestview, my household would be impacted immediately by this redistricting process. This has not only been a topic around our dinner table, but this has trickled down to our children discussing it in schools. I know firsthand how stressful this has been with our children and circulating speculation of moving schools. My wife made a great comment and poised a fantastic question to me which I thought about sharing with the board tonight. With such demand in specialty programs, why not increase or create directed programs in high schools that need students? There are so many kids who gets turned down over these very few coveted spots. Why not create new specialty programs or enlarge the programs we have? Henrico is a tremendous cutting edge school system, so why not evolve even further and create or increase our specialty schools to accommodate more students. If you build these programs, students will come voluntarily and residents would appreciate the programs that Henrico County Public Schools offer their residents. A potentially more simple solution that would move zero high school students against their will and create minimal disruptions to families. My children, myself and my community have been pitted against one another after every time a map gets distributed to the public. We have even witnessed this here tonight. I am sure everyone in attendance would appreciate the board to take additional time to evaluate all potential solutions that would not involve disrupting thousands of our residents and students. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Luke Kesson and I'm a rising eighth grader currently going to Pocahontas Middle School and I'm supposed to go to Godwin High School. I live in this Stonegate district. One of my favorite things to do are sports. The two sports that I play are football and wrestling. Since I do sports, I have, I have to have a way to get from my school back to my house afterward. The two ways that, the three ways that are possible or my dad picked me up, I walk home, or I go to daycare. Since I'm going to high school next, in two years, I will not be able to do daycare anymore. And I can't ride the bus home because they leave before the sports let out. My, dad's, my dad doesn't get out of work until af way after that. The walk time from Tucker to my house is one hour and 45 minutes, five and a half miles. Godwin is a half a mile and only 10 minute walk. If I were to go to Tucker, I would not be able to do either of the sports that I want to do because my dad wants me to be safe. The past minute has been probably the scariest minute of my life, but what could be even scarier is the thought of me leaving my friends that I have built up for the past seven years. I hope that you not only listen to me, but listen to the f everybody else here and take into consideration things that we've said. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name's Todd Springer. I lurk, live uh, in Oak Run near the Church Road community. Um, looking at the latest options, D&E, they're moving four to 5,000 students. <clears throat> We've seen options presented, option Z, others um, moving 500 students, 600 students. What's going on? The latest options have big changes. I see no convergence. Um, <clears throat> we still see the West Street, uh, West Broad Street and Short Pump as a blockade for all the middle school options. Um, we dealt with that, we thought we dealt with that with HCPS transportation back in December, but that bias still seems to exist. 
logic seems to have flown out the door. <clears throat> I, I do data science, a macro analysis. Uh, the solutions don't make sense. Um, locally, it breaks six of the seven redistricting uh, regulations. It's introducing feeder pattern splits. Um, personally, my child, 2.3 miles to Shore Pump Elementary, 1.6 miles to Pocahontas Middle, and two miles to Godwin. You're moving me, doubling the distance away from the schools that are further than the uh, elementary school my daughter goes to. What, what sense does that make? Um, <clears throat> you're breaking up our community. You're splitting up our community down the middle of um, our community center. So I request the data, I do data science, and I've received two FOIA requests, or FOIA um, rejection letters. I've got the Virginia FOIA request uh, GIS guidelines. The FOIA council has agreed with my position. The county owns the data. They can provide the data in a format that is acceptable, and the county is refusing to provide the data so we can develop better solutions. That's about transparency, a lack of transparency. What is the concern with providing the data? It's, it's baffling what's going on here. Um, again, the answer to the question is why? Why are you refusing to give data out to the community? I said this data is good to give to the, the uh, committee members to help them make intelligent decisions. Right now you're dumping massive amounts of information on them. They're suffocating, they don't know what to do. I'm talking about giving them intelligence to work with. And they're just, they're, they're, they're suffocating. Um, so anyway, that's, that's what I got. I hope you reconsider this. I don't really care about the data, to be honest. I can recreate it myself. This issue is about trans, uh, transparency and the lack thereof. We can constantly ask for clarification on the guidelines and we, we are refused to give clarification to us or the committee members. What is a natural boundary? What is a major roadway? You leave it up to free interpretation and bias. And that's what we see in the process. Thank you. Mr. Springer, thank you. I want to say on behalf of my peers, first and foremost, to all those who um, have spoken, number one, thank you for your attendance. But secondly, thank you for your advocacy, especially for our students from our various schools. I do want you all to know that uh, we as the board, as well as Dr. Cashwell and her entire staff, we do hear you and we will take in consideration um, your concerns um, that have been lifted tonight. So thank you again for your attendance. Thank you for your advocacy. That being said, um, we are now moving on from the period of um, public um, hearing form and we're gonna ask our superintendent to, uh, to approve the minutes. I'll approve the minutes. Well, you all have read the minutes that have been shared. Um, if there are no addendums or corrections, can I entertain a motion to approve the minutes as presented? So moved. It's been moved by Mrs. Second. Kinsella Second. and seconded by Mrs. Ogburn that the minutes will be approved. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Ayes have it, the minutes are approved. Dr. Cashwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. This evening I have um, several items which are consent items and therefore they can be taken in a block. I'm request, uh, requesting your approval of the following. The acceptance of monthly financial statements and budgetary status report for the months ending November 30, 2019 and December 31, 2019. Acceptance of the monthly financial statement for school nutrition services for the months ending November 30, 2019 and December 31, 2019. And also the approval of personnel items. You all have heard the recommendation um, for the acceptance of the consent items, the three items that were presented by Dr. Cashwell. Can I entertain a motion to accept uh, the consent items as uh, presented? So moved. It's been moved by Mrs. Shea. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. All those in favor, would you signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you so much. Thank you, and that concludes items from the superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. Thank you for your presentation. Um, um, board members, is there? Any unfinished business that um, we need to address tonight? What about any new business that needs to be addressed tonight? All right. Having um, none um, presented, I want to announce the upcoming meetings 
Um, our next meeting will be February the 13th, 2020, uh, 2 p.m. work session, um, 6 p.m. budget public hearing, uh, New Bridge Learning Center Auditorium. I do want to make it clear that meeting times can and may be adjusted if needed. That being said, um, this meeting is adjourned.